Okay, so hi everyone, good morning. Uh, I'm Naina Jain, I work for IBM Linux Technology Center out of IBM US and I'm mainly leading the secure boot effort for open power systems. Uh, today, the topic is open power secure boot host OS key management. This is a disclaimer just for, I'll just flash it for a second or two and then we can just go ahead. Okay, the agenda is, we'll start with some uh, background, then we'll get into the high level overview and actually the details after that. And then there's a debug and recovery thing and finally we'll end with summary and patch stages. I would like to give the acknowledgements to my whole IBM LTC security team who had been working and contributing to this work and uh, our collaboration with IBM Security Research Group and IBM Enterprise Power Security Team. Okay, so let's get it started. Uh, well, there have been enough of presentations over the secure boot around the years. So I'll just give a basic definition to get started here. So what is secure boot? It actually implies that only authenticated firmware and operating system are allowed to be executed at all times. So it involves authenticated firmware. That means there are two things which are involved as part of secure boot. One is signature verification and another is key management. And this key, manage, this key management is required to, do, to handle the keys which are used to verify the signatures. The signature verification part, there was a presentation on it we had given last year in Linux Security Summit Europe 2018. And this year, so today's presentation will mainly focus over the key management part. Okay, so the high level overview. Uh, this is just again to get into the flow. I uh, will not get into details. Again, the details of this. This has been discussed about uh, in different pres uh, presentations in different conferences. So let's get started uh, here. Um, secure boot, open power secure boot, if you look at the block, it starts from here, the, the, the main hardware, the core root of trust, which is starts from SB, and it loads host boot, ski boot, ski root host source. Uh, so this is actually divided into two parts. There is a firmware and then there is a host source. So the whole secure boot on open power has two domains. One is firmware secure boot, and once the ski boot, which is also called as OPAL, it loads the boot loader, we start with the host OS secure boot. So today's focus is mainly on the key management part of the OS secure boot, that is for the loading of host OS. Uh, one of the important thing to remember here is that the boot kernel, in case of open power, it is actually a petite boot application running, running on a Linux based uh, kernel. So we use a K exec here and then it loads the host source. And the key management and the signature verification are handled differently for some firmware secure boot and the OS secure boot. So we'll be only focusing on OS secure boot. Okay, so what is key management? Uh, so let's uh, say, uh, a key management is basically managing keys in a crypto system that involves creation, protection, storage, and control over the usage of the keys. So as part of this, it goes to different phases where you start with key generation and installation, it's a storage, where do you use it, and then how do you destroy it in case of revocation or expiry or rotation, if you need to. And what are the currently existing mechanisms as part of secure boot key management? So they are like different, but in context of secure boot. So there is like currently we have UEFI key management and then there's the shim which does its own. So if we uh, just uh, see it into specific key properties like the variables which are being defined for the UEFI are like PK, KK, DB, DBX. The thing is by default it is bit in a controlled way and you can reset it later, but by default it comes as a controlled thing. And the shim has mock list and mock list text. And shim mainly takes care of the OS secure boot, and that is once you get into the bootloader, but the UEFI actually is the same for the firmware and then to the OS. The key hierarchy in case of the UEFI is you have the highest key authority PK, then which is from the OEM, then KK, and then the DB or DBX, which is for the OS verification, and in case of shim, it is the password based. The tools which are used for UFR, EFI tools and then shim, it is mock util. 
The key containers where the way you uh, had the, you store the certificates or the hashes. In case of UFI, it is EFI signature list that is ESL, and in Shim also it's, uh, it is handles the ESLs. The authentication of key updates. Um, the UF, it, uh, the UFI has a UFI authentication variable header, which is like a, it embeds the P, detached PKCS7 signature format, and in case of Shim, it is password based. And for the key updates, um, you need may or may not require physical presence for UFI, but in case depending on how you do it. But in case of Shim, you need physical presence because you need to enter the password when you are into the mock manager for enrolling the keys. So this is what exists currently. So now let's see what is on the open power. And the main goal is to keep as much as compatible as possible, keep it secure, keep it flexible so that it can be extended with ease of automation. So let's go through this journey of key management on open power and see if we are able to achieve this goal or not. Um, I'll break this key management into the three layers. So there is a user who has to do the operations like the sysadmins, the distros and all, and then this, to get the, the user interface is exposed by the kernel, which is the second layer, which provides also an access between the user and the firmware. And the kernel is the one which is also going to use it because the bootloader is kernel based. And then there is a firmware which actually does the key management, uh, the key updates processing. It is the one which is controlling the, the, the handling or controlling or handling the keys. So the key initialization, its verification and its switch path is with firmware. So let's get more deeper. Again, breaking it down into further components. The firmware, we need to store the keys to make them persistent. So here comes the key storage. This is the persistent storage. The persistent storage are two here. There is a PNR and the TPM. The thing is, we need a secure storage to ensure the integrity of the, key, of the keys. TPM provides the security and PNR provides the enough space, which is not there in TPM. So we combine the good properties of both of them and, try, and provide the secure storage. This storage is accessible via firmware, which is the ski boot in case of open power. Ski boot, or you also call it as OPAC. And it handles, it provides access via Opal APIs to the kernel and the user interface. And it does all the handling of the key updates, key manipulations, who can access, who cannot access, etc. And then uh, this is the kernel, which provides access for the user space. And again, as I said, uh, it also uses it. And manual is the user space. The ellipses, which I've shown here, are uh, available at runtime. And uh, the rectangles which I've shown here are actually the boot time, the components which actually does the processing at boot time. The one thing which I want to specify here is the most of the key of this processing we are doing is in ski boot, not in the kernel. Why can't we actually make the kernel to do all the processing? The thing is, the hardware, the, the actual, the key storage, which is accessible, we, we wanted to keep the exposure limited and block the so access to it as early as possible because the TPM security, which we do is, is by locking it. So we didn't want to expose it at, to the point where the users or the networking gets enabled or the uh, file systems gets enabled and all. So we wanted to lock it, access to this as early as possible. And that is where this keyboard, this reduces the exposure. So that is where it's done at the firmware side. Okay, so we will take a top-down approach. We will start from like, assuming a user wants to start with setting up the keys and how does it go through this, the whole process goes. So key generation and installation. Okay, uh, I need a tool to generate the keys. What should I do? So which ones should I use? So. Support uh, asymmetric keys, it's a signature verification bar, asymmetric keys, RSA 2048 and SHA 512. The container for the keys, that is the certificates and hashes, is Tianoco derived EFI signature list. So we use ESL as a container for the keys. Uh, the updates, when you sign the keys uh, for the update, the structure which holds this signature as well as the uh, new data is uh, again Tianoco derived, which is EFI variable authentication to descriptor. We use the authentication to descriptor as it uh, is based on time system and it helps protecting against deep attacks. The tools are, uh, we have taken the minimum utilities from the EFI tools and ported them to the power 
and they are called as the sequoia tools now. So the three utilities which we have ported are CERT to EFI Siglis, which converts from certificate to as an ESL, uh, and then the sign EFI Siglis which signs it, and the hash to EFI Siglis for converting hashes into an EFI container. This is how the whole structure looks like. Uh, when you, so if using these utilities, I generated a certificate, I generated an ESL, and I generated a signed command, this is how it will look like. It will have a header structure authentication too, which will have some of its metadata, and then a PKCS7 detached signature. This, and at, at the end, appended with the new keys ESL, which you want to actually get updated onto the database. So I have now this command with me, uh, which I need to give to the, submit to the system or install onto the system. Now here comes before uh, I install, am I allowed to install, or who should be doing the installation? So there comes the, there comes the point of authorization, and who is authorized to do what? We the the, the variable names are if I like. Uh, we continue to use we use PK, KEK, DBO, DBX. The PK is the highest security authority. It has the authority to install the intermediate keys, and it can be more than even for the secure boot. The KEKs are the intermediate keys who has the authority to install the DB or DBX for the signature verification. The DB and DBX are the keys used for kernel verification. KEK can sign the DB or DBX boots. That's so the thing to note here is each ESL hand, uh, stores multiple certificates and one key can sign one ESL and it does not sign, in, sign individual certificates in the ESL. So it is, we currently support replace mode and not the append mode. Now, again, the point here is, the, the question can come, why, why did we decide the three level hierarchy? We could have decided the two level hierarchy. It could have been PK with DB alone and it could have been KEK with DB alone. There is no need of PK. So, but if you see this, uh, assuming, take an example, uh, there is an organization and who have there's, a, they, they, there's one organization and it has multiple departments, and each department has a sysadmin. And even a department can have sysadmins in the shifts working. So, so if there's only a single PAK, then it's the organization which has to handle, take care of assigning authorities for, or handling the DBs for everyone. If there's no PK, but there, is a, there are multiple KEKs, then there's a complexity who authorizes whom. And when you do that, there is also complexity of who has actually installed the DB or who has installed the DBX. So how do you keep track of all of this? So this defines, this gives an optimum level of managing the hierarchy at the organization level. You have the highest department level, PK authorized, who, div, who, who gives the systems and assigns KEKs, which can be sysadmins in each of these departments, and then these sysadmins are allowed to install the DB keys. And this is uh, admins, even if they're working in the shifts, they can install the DB or DBX keys. So this is how this hierarchy becomes an optimal level to, do, to, to achieve what is required as part of organization key management thing. Uh, now, another aspect of the flexible key authorities, this is what, as we say, is that there might be different cases where I want, the way I want to install it. I might be a sysadmin and I want to install my own Linux kernel. I might have got something shipped, but I want to install my own Linux kernel. So in that case, I have I generate my public-private key pairs, and I sign the kernel with my DB key, and then I have my KK, so I, I can sign my DB with my KK and then install it. That is one case. There might be another case where I'm the sysadmin, but I've got the, I have to install a distro package, a distro OS, and I would have got a key from them. So how do I install that? So in that case, I. I use that key as a DB key, but I sign it as a sysadmin with my KEK, and then I install it. And there can be a third case where the system comes with the shipped, pre-shipped DB, PK, KEK, and DB, and then in that case, they want to have their own keys installed. So it provides a flexible key authority, and it's, uh, there's no centralized system control, and it provides an options based on the requirements you want to satisfy. So this is how the design for the key hierarchy and what, how many levels are optimum has been decided. Okay, so I got the keys, I know I need to install it, and what's the interface available to me? So there are two interfaces we have expressed as part of the kernel. One is device tree, 
So the properties are of the internal key management status are read only properties which are they are exposed via device key. Uh, the OS secure enforcing property. So we call it the interface is a sec where you will see a node is sec where the OS secure enforcing property tells whether the secure boot is enabled or disabled. The second thing is for submitting the keys, uh, we have provided the SysFS interface which allows you to do a read or write of keys. And they are exposed via sys firmware secware And it can be enabled via config secware sysfs. The patches for it are in the work of progress which we are trying to get upstream. So the kernel has got the keys via sysfs and it needs to give it to the firmware. So the next step is kernel firmware interface. And that comes as part of a, the, the interface which we have implemented called the secware operations. It provides a pluggable interface get, get next set. Uh, PowerPC based platform can implement uh, this interface to provide, to use the SysFS and for different platforms. Since currently the secure boot support we are doing is for Power Envy systems, we have implemented Opel APIs as the interface. At the SKI boot level, so now at the firmware level. So this is the kernel interface for the firmware, but now firmware also has to expose. So that is the Opel API interface, which, and that work is being done by Eric Richter from my team. And that is where the kernel starts talking to the firmware. Kernel had given the request or the key update command to the firmware. Now what does firmware do it? So it has to handle that command. Uh, so there comes now storage. Uh, the PNOR storage, so I said, in, uh, we have two storage, PNOR and TPM. The TPM provides the security and pro PNOR provides the storage. Uh, um, I mean space, more space. PNOR is divided into two parts. One is for the keys and one is for the update command. So whatever key updates we have to do, data is stored into the update bank and into the update bank partition. Um, the key store is maintained as two banks so that if you need to roll back because of any failure reasons, you can do that. And they are, there is also an in-memory cache maintained by the firmware itself, which is available at runtime. So that you, I mean, the, the, during the boot time, the keys are loaded from the persistent storage to the in-memory and that is what available at runtime. Again, this support is like the storage driver support is like a pluggable, so it can be extended to support different storage devices. Uh, for now, it is implemented for PNO and TPM combination. The TPM driver at the firmware level is taken from IBM's TSS, which is by Kenneth Goldman, who is from IBM Security Research, and it has been modified to use embed TLS. So, so we, we got uh, the uh, uh, command, we stored it into the update bank, and what next? So the next thing is, uh, yeah, before the next thing, so there's the storage internals. This is the pluggable hook which I was talking about. And uh, if you want to add an addition, an addition, additional storage device, which is different from Pinot storage, these are the interfaces to be implemented. So that is how it is made, is flexible or extensible. Okay, so now, once you store the key update command, there's a need, need of, reboot. You reboot the system and then when the reboot starts before update processing. So when the reboot starts and the system comes back to the firmware or PAL key boot level, it starts the processing of those key updates. And the component which handles this is called the backend component for the key management. Again, the work is being taken care by Eric Richter. Uh, what is this backend actually? It provides, it defines the supported variables the sign this structure or the signing algorithms for the keys. And it also provides the definition of the, I mean, what type of authority or the authentication is allowed, author, the key hierarchies, the secure boot modes. So it basically defines what the user space tool should be doing. And how user space tools can know about this is by use, looking at the device key property, which is available at the SecWare backend. The backend compatible flag can help the user space tools. It, it lets user space tools to know what type of the signing algorithm or the modes or the, the structure, the container structure is being supported. Uh, this is where the backend comes into picture. Again, the backend is flexible. Tomorrow, if we want to change the support for the signing algorithm or we want to handle different container or a different way of handling these uh, modes, then 
it can be done by because as they are provided as extensible. Uh, you need to update the compatible flag to represent what you are providing. The thing is, uh, uh, it, it, you, and, and the driver should provide these functions, pre-process, process, post-process, post and validate. The one which we are implementing currently is derived from Tianoco reference implementation, EDK2, and, that's, that, and it looks, because like we, we are processing the ESLs and the authentication header, so that is how we call it. So now the, when the backend comes into it gets loaded, it, uh, it, it reads the update commands from the, each of, from the update bank and how they get processed. If it is a PK and if it is a first sign PK, it gets sold. But if it is, there is already a PK existing in it, that means it, has, it should be verifiable by the existing PK. So presence of PK defines the secure boot mode. If it is, there is no PK, the secure boot is disabled. If there is PK, secure boot is enabled. The KKs are verified via PK and the DB or DBX is verifiable via PK or KK. In case the secure boot is disabled, no verification is done. If the secure boot is enabled, the PK CS7 structure from the author is extracted and the new ESL data which has been submitted gets verified against it. Uh, we, have the, we are using embed TLS as the crypto library at this key boot of firmware level, uh, but, the pro but the embed TLS does not provide PK CS7 support. So we had implemented a limited support for it and we are going to open source it. We are working on it, so we are going to submit the request for the uh, embed TLS group and contribute to that. Uh, so this is how the key updates processing gets done and if the signature gets verified, it gets stored into the key store partition of to the pin owner. Now, so let's get, that is where comes the part of storing into the memory, making it persistent. So what does that involve? So now comes a part of the protection of the key storage or the protection of the key database. So the KEKs or the DB or DBX, which are intermediate authorities, they are stored in PINO. But the highest security authority, which is PK, that is stored in TPM to reduce the attack surface. Again, then, and the PK is single. Then the integrity of PINO is maintained by we store the hash of the key store of the PNOR into the TPM. So there is always a check done whenever the system loads, it always checks the integrity of the PNOR key store with the hash into the TPM before actually loading it into the in-memory. And if there is a mismatch, it, 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 it considers it as something, something wrong or something malicious or corrupted and then it does not load the key store. The steps to maintain the PNOR secure by TPM are so when the key store has to be made persistent, the first thing it does is it writes the hashes of the key store, the in-memory key store, to the TPM. Then it makes the key store persistent to the PNO, and then it write logs those TPM NV indices. So whenever I was saying it's stored into the TPM, I meant it is stored into the NV, NV storage of the TPM, uh, and then it write logs them. So that it, after that, nothing can be updated into those indices and it can be unlocked only after reboot. So by the time the Opal or the firmware now loads the bootloader and which now has access, even the network access or the file access, the TPM has already been logged and there cannot be any modification done at the key store. So this is where it, the point comes of that we are actually doing the, uh, uh, the processing at the firmware level and not the key, key kernel level. And once it gets, uh, everything is locked, the locking is done via the platform authentication property of the TPM. So this is where how the key storage is made secure with the combination of the PNOR and the TPM. So I have got my keys uh, processed, updated, stored into the PNOR. They are also available in memory, but they are actually, this all is, was being done so that bootloader can use these keys for the kernel signature verification. So let's come to the key usage. Um, there are two things of the key usage. One was the update, key updates verification itself, which we already talked, like PK verifies KK and KK verifies DB, DBX. So variable bank actually verifies the update bank. The second is the kernel verification. And this is where the, we did all this so that the bootloader can verify the host source. So how does the, 
kernel gets the keys which are actually at the firmware or which are actually handled or controlled by the firmware. So it is the same Opel API interface which I explained a few minutes back at the, for the CFS interface, uh, for in context of CFS interface. So the kernel keying code, it calls Opel API interface, it loads DB keys to dot platform keying and the DBX keys to the dot blacklist keying. The dot platform keying is what was being introduced by us in the last year sometime and this is the one which is being used by IMA. So the, for the signature verification, we use IMA and IMA uses the platform keying. It uses its, uh, we define the ARC specific policies. Some of this was being done as part of signature verification and they are being upstream. Uh, this support of the loading the keys in PowerPC for dot platform and dot blacklist can be enabled via load PPC keys. And this is how it looks like, there's the dot platform and the blacklist. Coming to the blacklist, currently we support the hashes of the blacklisted binary. For the signature verification, we use appended signatures and not extended attributes parts of the IMA because the extended attributes are not available for all the cases like for the net boot and all. So we use the appended signatures. Uh, and blacklist binary, when I say it implies the hash of the binary without the appended signature. So that is what the support of the blacklist is here. So this is in summary the verification flow. So kernel called Opel APIs, got the keys from the firmware, stored it into the key ring, that is the kernel memory, and now how is they use it. So if the secure boot mode is disabled, no, none of the verification gets done. But if the secure boot mode is enabled, enabled, then the keys are loaded, DB keys are loaded to dot platform. There is a policy, ARC specific policy defined which says che uh, kernel check, KXZ kernel check, IMA flag is check blacklist, that is check for the blacklist before doing the appraisal, and the template is mode seek template, which is for appended signatures. And then before doing the appraisal, it looks, so IMA looks at the policy, so it knows that it has to check the blacklist, so it checks against the dot blacklist, and if the binary is not found is blacklisted, it actually does the appraisal. And if the appraisal is successful, it loads the host source. So this is how now the key got used. I, and so we have taken, we started from the top, and we have also taken the U-turn, and we are back to the user space where the host source gets loaded. Uh, what is the case now when I want to delete my keys because for case of revocation or the expired, and also how do we do that? So you will delete DB, DBX or KEK by submitting a signed update with empty data. If we have a valid PK still existing, then it can be also be deleted by submitting signed update. Deleting a PK means disabling the secure boot. So it's, it's possible to delete PK only if it is validly present into the TPM. If PK is detected as corrupted or its private is lost or PK is revoked, or if we want to change the ownership of the system, then in all these cases, we, have, we can only delete it via physical presence. Or we can already only modify via physical presence. And the key rotation is basically, okay, it, it's, it's basically doing the full cycle that you generate the new key, you delete the old key by submitting an empty data, signed empty data, and then you install the new key. And how do you do any logs, error logs, or recovery, or debugging it? So uh, open systems, the petite boot, which is the application, and then does the bootloader part. It has its own UI. You can see the status of the secure boot onto the UI. Uh, we are starting with the minimum interfaces onto the UI side, but then over the time, we plan to make the key management and everything from the UI interface. For now, it is available from the CFS. Um, any Opel error logs are, can be viewed via sys firmware Opel message log. The kernel error logs can be seen from the sys log. The device key properties can be looked at to see the secure boot state, whether it is enabled or disabled. The device key properties have the properties for status and update status, which tells whether the update processing was successful or not, and the key, manage, key management in the, the key boot got successfully initialized or not. The, here, uh, the PK, if the PK private is lost, then it can be recovered via physical presence. I mean, you clear it and then you install the new one. But you, you need physical presence in that context. 
And so the key takeaways for open faculty management is system owner is in full control, no central CA. Currently supported modes are like setup and user, which in context is like enabled, disabled. And we will add the audit mode support in the future. It provides SysFS interface for user space. We have ported minimum EFI tools to the power and it's, they are called the secret tools. Uh, the support is like for EFI like variables, PK, KK, DB or DBX. Uh, it accepts Cyanocode derived ESL and EFI variable authentication to descriptors. It requires a system reboot for the update processing and uh, storage is secured via maintaining integrity checks with the TPM. The physical presence is required for the recovery of PK and it supports replace mode as part of the initial starting and not the appended mode. So these are the key takeaways. So let's see, uh, did we achieve our goal? And we said that we need to, we want to keep it as much as compatible, secure, flexible, and ease of automation. So the variables which are used are PK, KK, DB, DBX. The key ownership is flexible. There is no centralized CA and there is no default uh, controlled like thing. So it is flex open and flexible. The key hierarchy is PK, KK, DB, PK to KK and KK to DB or DBX, but if somebody wants to keep it minimum and just a single authority, then PK to DB or DBX is also possible. Uh, the tools which are used are Segway tools and derived from EFI tools. The container is EFI signature list. The authentication key update of key updates is done with the EFI variable authentication to descriptor. And the updates do not require physical presence until you actually need to uh, recover the PK or clear the PK without authenticating it. So that is the only place where you need physical presence so it can ease the automation for the organization. So that is what we said. We want to give as much as compatible, secure, flexible, and then autom easy for automation. And this is the patch set status. The work has been going on for the ski boot mail into the ski boot mailing list, the embed TLS for the PKCA7 support, the kernel to get the SysFS interface and the ARC specific policies and the blacklist support for blacklist support from the IMA side, ARC specific policies for power and the loading of keys for power. The signature verification related patches have been accepted already. The appended signatures had become part of it recently, V5.4. So there is a, the, the work had been ongoing some time and the user space interface, the SACWARE tools, that is something work in progress and we will get it like, yeah, we, have, we have it working and ported in power, but like, yeah, like more publishing it. Yeah. These are the general references. There is a development GitHub repo we are maintaining for now to try it out. But the patches are still like in the process of up steaming. And yeah, any questions? Questions? Not questions. Not Thank you.